Great. Thanks so much, Ben. And thanks everyone who's tuning in on Twitch tonight. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you some environmental engineering research and some water chemistry. Um, I, I know it may not look like it, but this wetland that's shown on my title slide is actually part of the water treatment infrastructure for Disneyland. So uh, upstream of Anaheim in the Orange County Water District is this wetland that's used to improve water quality. Um, and today I'm gonna to be talking about um, sort of broadly starting by talking about some of the water challenges that are being faced by cities, um, including the increasing identification of contaminants in our water supply. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how nature-based solutions like the constructed wetland I'm showing here can play a role in addressing some of these challenges. Um, and then I'll also delve a bit into the role green chemistry can play uh, in protecting ecosystems through intentionally designing chemicals for their environmental fate. Uh, but first, I know we have a broad range of backgrounds potentially in the audience today. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of info um, just about water quality engineering and the challenges faced by cities regarding water quality. Oops. So uh, today, a lot of our cities have water infrastructure that looks something like this. Um, we take water from the environment, often from surface water reservoirs or potentially from groundwater and pass it through a drinking water treatment plant. This provides uh, treatment like filtration and likely disinfection. And that water is then distributed to homes and businesses in our cities. After use, that water is mostly uh, sent through a piped sewer system that conveys it to a wastewater treatment plant where it is treated again before being discharged into the environment to some sort of receiving water body. And that might be a river or a lake, or it might be the ocean. And this whole system of treating water and wastewater uh, was a big achievement for um, early environmental engineers and figuring out how to uh, make water safe to drink and how to um, put it back in the environment without inducing massive uh, ecosystem damages. Unfortunately, now in the 21st century, these uh, water systems are being stressed by multiple stressors, including climate change and urbanization that are resulting in increasing water stress. So in many parts of the US and the world, um, we're seeing increasing incidence of drought conditions um, as the climate changes. And we're also seeing increasing incidences of intense uh, precipitation that results in flooding in our cities. Uh, this is actually a picture taken in Toronto a couple of years ago. What this means is that we end up being short on drinking water in the summer um, and we end up having runoff from our cities uh, during these flooding events that can harm ecosystems in the rain rainy season. In addition, we're increasingly detecting uh, contaminants in our water and wastewater that can harm aquatic organisms and human health. So to give an early example of this, um, for over a decade, we've known that the birth control, the ingredient in birth control pills called ethanyl estradiol or EE2 um, is an endocrine disrupting compound, uh, which means that it can affect the endocrine systems of aquatic organisms. So what I'm showing here is in the left graph, um, the Vitelligenin concentration in fish plasma. So that very far left bar showing uh, the concentration of vitelligenin in female and male fish um, indicates that vitelligenin is normally present in female fish. It's actually a protein associated with egg production. So female fish produce eggs, male fish do not. Uh, but when exposed to low concentrations of the hormone in birth control pills, male fish start producing this same egg protein, and that's what we call feminization. And this actually results in an inability for the species to reproduce. Um, this is a, an example that's been very well documented that fish living downstream of wastewater treatment plants that get exposed to um, these compounds um, may have reproductive effects, but there are actually lots of different wastewater derived contaminants in our, that pass through our wastewater treatment systems. Things including pharmaceuticals and personal care products, um, perfluorinated compounds, microplastics and pesticides, flame retardants that are used on products in our homes, 
and disinfection byproducts that occur when we chlorinate water and wastewater. For most of these, we don't actually know um, the exact concentrations at which they might cause ecotoxic effects. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing research to try to understand the ecosystem impacts of discharging all of these compounds. So what, what can we do as uh, engineers to address all of these simultaneous impacts that are occurring on our existing infrastructure? Well, to address the impacts of water scarcity and flooding, um, part of what we're doing is building new systems that harvest local uh, sources of water, such as stormwater and wastewater. So for instance, we're taking some of the water that falls as rain on our cities and harvesting it to use, uh, to use again. Um, so treating it as a water resource instead of um, conveying it directly to receiving water bodies. We're also in some cases taking our treated wastewater and treating it further before using it again. Um, so both of these result in the ability to rely less heavily on external uh, further away water supplies like surface water supplies and giving us a more resilient and local supply of water. It can also reduce impacts on local ecosystems. So these are seen as really positive um, innovations in the 21st century. Unfortunately, these can also result in new pathways for uh, organic contaminants to enter the urban water cycle. So for instance, in stormwater, we might have uh, compounds that uh, run from, that are taken up by the stormwater as it runs off of our buildings and streets. So things that uh, are found in roofing and paint materials, uh, in tires and asphalt, uh, urban use pesticides, flame retardants, and road salts. And in our reused wastewater, we have all those contaminants that I talked about before um, that pass through our wastewater treatment plants um, and could then end up in our potable water supply. So today I'm going to focus um, in on this water reuse part of the picture and uh, talk about the fate of certain contaminants um, when we're reusing wastewater. So first, um, as I mentioned previously, water scarcity is increasingly prevalent in our major cities. To give you a sense of where potable reuse of wastewater is occurring, uh, where I am in California, we already have several water districts that are doing it or in the planning stages. So this picture in the top left is where um, we had a field site in the San Francisco Bay Area during my PhD research. Um, but there are several others in California also and then this map from the US Environmental Protection Agency shows existing and planned potable reuse projects throughout the country. And as you can see, they're um, heavily concentrated in the South and Southwest, but also um, there are some up in Washington state. The oldest and longest operating potable reuse system in the world was actually in Windhoek, Namibia, where they've been doing potable reuse for 50 years. Um, Singapore has recently been uh, investing in water reuse and they've branded their water as new water. And then there are a couple examples in Europe. So one in Belgium uh, called the Toril Project where they infiltrate recycled water through these sand dunes into a drinking water aquifer. And in Australia where water reuse actually hasn't taken off quite as much as desalination, but there's a potable reuse facility in Perth in Western Australia. So, we can see there are several examples where reusing wastewater and treating it enough to make it drinkable again is already happening around the world. Um, and it's likely that more and more cities will be embracing this as a water resource in the coming years. So when we do conduct potable reuse of wastewater, we often do what's called full advanced treatment. This involves taking effluent from a wastewater treatment plant and passing it through an advanced treatment facility, which usually includes a combination of membrane filtration and advanced oxidation. The membrane filtration process includes a microfiltration or ultrafiltration, and then reverse osmosis. So microfiltration has um, larger pore sizes and reverse osmosis has very small pore sizes, um, removing even more contaminants. 
And then an advanced oxidation process is used to oxidize any contaminants that might make it through those very uh, fine RO membranes. Um, here I'm showing uh, UV and hydrogen peroxide as the advanced oxidation process. And after these multiple barriers to all of our contaminants, the resulting water is of very high quality. It can be amended uh, to existing water resources and um, used as drinking water. Some even argue that it is cleaner than our most current water supplies. But the downside of this particular set of, of treatment processes is that when you conduct reverse osmosis, you have a reject stream of everything that doesn't pass through the membrane. This is called reverse osmosis concentrate. And it makes up about 15% of the wastewater that you send to the advanced treatment facility. And to give you a sense of scale, um, a small water reuse plant would be making at least 10 million gallons per day of recycled wastewater. And so they'd be making at least 2 million gallons per day of reverse osmosis concentrate. That's a lot of waste. Um, and this RO concentrate, as I'll be calling it, contains most of the contaminants that were originally present in our wastewater, but at higher concentrations. So it contains uh, a lot of organic contaminants, nutrients, metals, and salts. To give you a sense of these concentrations, um, I've laid out a list of some common contaminants that are found in wastewater that we measured in RO concentrate. And here are some uh, concentrations at which they have effects on aquatic organisms. So for instance, here, if we look at fipronil, which is an insecticide used in uh, tea and, uh, flea and tick products, uh, for instance, that you might use on your pet dog, uh, it has an effect on aquatic organisms at approximately 11 nanograms per liter, whereas its concentration in RO concentrate is about an order of magnitude higher than that. So that indicates that if we were to discharge this concentrate into the environment, uh, it would likely be acutely toxic to, uh, to some aquatic organisms. This is especially important in areas where uh, dilution of the concentrate would be limited near the point of discharge. So um, I was working with a water district down in San Jose, California. So here I'm showing the San Francisco Bay. Um, for those not familiar, San Francisco is up here on this peninsula and there's this small inlet here under which or over which the Golden Gate Bridge crosses. Um, at, down at the very southern end of the bay, there's not a lot of mixing and dilution going on with that ocean water. Uh, and so if you are a discharger down at the southern end of the bay, you don't get any credit for uh, mixing at your point of discharge. And you really have to be concerned about the concentrations that you're putting into the environment. So this water district in particular was concerned about uh, discharging their concentrate and we needed to come up with a treatment solution. A major parameter that we needed to deal with here though is we needed a solution that was low cost. Um, and that's because water reuse is already a relatively expensive source of drinking water um, because of these advanced treatment processes. And so adding further uh, expensive treatment processes to the concentrate side um, could make the use of water reuse not feasible, not financially feasible. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we need something that's relatively low cost. It's not gonna bring up the overall cost of our reuse facility too much. It needs to address a pretty broad array of contaminants, including nutrients and trace organics. And for me in my work, I'm really interested in how we can use nature-based solutions um, because they can also provide co-benefits like ecosystem services and um, accessible outdoor space and uh, they can also be lower cost than a lot of engineered advanced treatment processes um, because they don't require chemical or energy inputs, um, or at least much lower energy inputs, um, and don't require as many operators to, um, uh, to operate them. So this can make them a lot more accessible to water districts with limited budgets. They can also potentially remove uh, multiple classes of contaminants simultaneously, like nutrients and trace organics. But as with many other technologies, they're mostly not optimized for trace contaminant removal. So to give a short primer on how contaminants are removed in constructed wetland systems, 
um, in this uh, in this sort of cartoon of a constructed wetland. I have on the left side is a subsurface flow wetland. So here the water flows through a coarse substrate in the subsurface. Um, contaminants that are present in that uh, water or wastewater can adsorb to um, organic uh, layers in the, in the subsurface. They can undergo microbial biotransformations because microbial communities thrive in this subsurface conditions or they can be taken up by plants and transported into the biomass of plants. Um, in open water systems or surface flow systems, we can still have microbial biotransformation um, and we can also have sunlight uh, induce phototransformation of organic contaminants. So for instance, um, some compounds like this, this one shown here, which is a, a pharmaceutical, um, can directly absorb light in the sunlight spectrum and can be transformed. Other compounds um, are also phototransformed, but through an indirect mechanism where organic matter that's just present in the water absorbs sunlight and forms photoproduced reactive intermediates like hydroxyl radical and singlet oxygen, which then react with our organic contaminant. In both cases, we get uh, transformation of that organic contaminant though. So as you can see, there are multiple different mechanisms relevant in these nature-based treatment systems, and that can make them um, more efficient for a wider range of contaminants that we might be targeting. Uh, so in, in my PhD research, I was looking at the use of what we call open water unit process wetlands um, for RO concentrate treatment. These are um, some of probably the least wetland-like wetlands that you'll see <laughs> in that they're not planted. Um, they are open water cells that are intended to provide really idealized plug flow hydraulic conditions. So we have a really consistent hydraulic retention time and they're designed to have optimal sunlight penetration. So we don't have shading of the water column from plants. What this allows us to do is have sort of maximum amount of sunlight phototransformation. And we also get the growth of a photosynthetic uh, biomat, or which is a consortium of algae and associated heterotrophic bacteria that live on the bottom of these systems. So they, uh, the open water wetland is shallow, only 20 to 30 centimeters deep, and that allows sunlight to penetrate all the way to the, to the bottom of the water column where this biomat grows. So in this way, the open water wetlands combine photo and biological treatment in order to address uh, contaminants that might be susceptible to each. In this study that I'm going to be talking about, um, we also tested the use of ozone as a pretreatment to the wetland uh, cells. And that was with the idea that um, oxidative pretreatment might uh, address even further contaminants beyond those susceptible to photo or biotransformation. Um, so it was building off this idea of using multiple mechanisms. And I should mention um, ozone is a common water wastewater treatment technology that's used for oxidizing trace organics. Um, and this work was done in collaboration with uh, some folks at Stanford who um, are experts on ozonation technology. So in this study, um, we ran a pilot scale treatment system with two cells, two wetland cells operating in parallel. The first was receiving reverse osmosis concentrate directly from an adjacent advanced treatment facility that was conducting water reuse. And the second cell received the same RO concentrate after pretreatment by ozonation. Both cells are designed with a three day hydraulic retention time um, and we would sample at the inlet one third, two thirds of the way through and at the outlet. So that gives us essentially a profile of um, concentrations after one, two and three days in the cells. We ran this system for um, over two years, um, sampling throughout the entire study period. And the initial several months were really um, the time when that biomat was establishing on the bottom of the cells. So we don't actually seed the cells with anything. They have this uh, microbial community that uh, establishes 
just from uh, microorganisms that deposit in the cells from the surrounding environment or that are present in the wastewater itself. And so um, it does take some time for that uh, microbial community to establish and grow into a uh, functional biomat. And then throughout, we were analyzing a lot of different um, water quality parameters. So from general water quality things to nutrients, metals, trace organics, and um, again, looking at the establishment of that biomat by querying the microbial community. And I I'm not gonna talk about most of these today. I'm gonna really focus in on the trace organics, um, but I'm happy to answer some questions about the others if, if folks are interested. Um, before I jump into the water quality results, I'm gonna take just a minute to understand how the biomat developed in this pilot scale system. So uh, this microbial biomat developed um, over the course of, of the study and mostly stabilized after about 18 months. Um, here you can see on the X axis is the number of months since we started up the system in July of 2017. And each row is a, a, fam a bacterial family. Um, so not to focus too much on each line, but just to show how the sort of colors across change um, with time. And in each of these green boxes represents uh, a summer. So this, is, this first box is the summer of 2018 and the second box is the summer of 2019. And I'm gonna be showing um, sort of average data for summer performance later. So I just box these to show that there was some change in the community um, uh, from the summer of 2018 to the summer of 2019, but actually there was not much difference between the communities that developed in cell one and cell two. So there wasn't really a difference um, depending on if we pre-ozonated the RO concentrate before it went into the wetland cell. Um, so this is, this is interesting because it tells us that that um, pretreatment didn't significantly affect um, which microorganisms grew downstream. Okay, so moving into talking about the trace organic contaminants in this system. Um, we monitored um, two different types, or we monitored trace organic contaminants for two different reasons. The first is a set of indicator compounds um, that can tell us how the performance of the system stacks up against other open water wetlands um, and what, what mechanisms are at play. So for instance, we have two compounds that we know are uh, highly susceptible to phototransformation. This includes propranolol and carboxyabacavir, and two compounds that we know are susceptible to biological transformation in open water wetlands. So that's atenolol and metaprolol. Um, we also want to look at some specific compounds that we expect to have effects on aquatic organisms at relatively low concentrations. So I'm calling these ecologically relevant compounds. And these include um, fipronil and imidacloprid, which are both um, insecticides that are broadly used in urban areas. And then three other pharmaceuticals, propranolol, sulfamethoxazole, and carbamazepine. Um, so we measured all of these each time that we sampled from the pilot scale system. All right, so moving into the results, here I'm showing uh, the rates of removal that we observed and that we modeled um, based on uh, uh, a model that has been developed for rates of biotransformation in open water wetlands um, treating municipal wastewater. So uh, the bars represent the average uh, removal rate observed in the summer of 2018 or the summer of 2019. In 2018, we had six sampling events in the summer and in 2019, we had three. So here's average and standard deviation. And on the y-axis is a pseudo first order rate constant for removal that's derived from those multiple sampling points throughout the cell. Um, and what we can see here is that for compounds that undergo biotransformation, um, we were able to approximately model the rates of removal using this model that, as I said, was developed for municipal wastewater effluent. Um, so what this means is that the, um, the microbial community that developed in this system 
was functionally similar to what develops in uh, more traditional municipal wastewater effluent um, and that uh, our model <laughs> worked even though we were uh, conducting, even though we built this system in a different city where we had, and we didn't inoculate it with anything, um, it is still able functionally to uh, produce a biomat that uh, biotransformed these contaminants. We also look at our indicator compounds for phototransformation. And here we also use models to predict the removal rates by photolysis. But this is a more uh, mechanistic model that's based on quantum yields for these compounds um, and their rate constants with the re reactive intermediates. So you can see that the modeled bars here are stacked and they include uh, contributions from direct photolysis and from reactions of each compound with hydroxyl radical, triplet states of dissolved organic matter, carbonate radical, singlet oxygen, and nitrogen dioxide. Um, so at, what we can see here, I guess the first takeaway is that our photo transformation was faster in 2019 than in 2018. And this um, is not self-evident, but this is because we had um, higher levels of cloud cover in 2018, which shields sunlight. Um, and we also had some issues with floating algae in the cells, um, which obviously blocks sunlight penetration into the water column. Once we were able to work out um, those uh, floating algae and flow issues in 20, after 2018, um, and when we had sunny days in 2019 and when sampling, um, we can see that um, for propranolol, our prediction is still higher than our model, or sorry, our prediction is still higher than our observed rates. Um, and this is likely because the reaction between propranolol and triplet states of dissolved organic matter, which is its primary removal mechanism, that reaction is inhibited by higher uh, um, salt concentrations. So salinity is known to slow down those reaction rates. Um, and that's not accounted for in this model. So it's probably the salts in the RO concentrate that are um, resulting in our observed rates being slower uh, than the modeled rates. For carboxyabacavir, we're pretty close um, between our observed and modeled rates. Um, this model is actually for abacavir, not carboxyabacavir, because we don't have all of those quantum um, yield and reaction rate constants for the carboxylate of this compound. Um, so, uh, and we know that carboxyabacavir phototransforms about 15% slower than abacavir itself. So, um, on um, the same chemical basis, these actually are essentially matching because this is about 15% lower than the model rate. So, we're able to more or less model the rate of phototransformation of carboxyabacavir. Um, and we probably need a little more data on uh, the role of salinity in affecting organic matter sensitized reactions to better model propranolol rates. Um, but overall, our, our open water wetland for RO concentrate acted similarly to um, how these open water wetland systems have acted for municipal wastewater effluent and gives us some um, basis on which we could predict their um, uh, their applicability to other water matrices. All right, let's take a look at what this all means for some of our other contaminants of ecotoxicological concern. So uh, here we can see that those removal rates I was showing in the previous slides translate to uh, removals of over 75% of our indicator compounds. So on the y-axis here, Instead of a rate constant, I'm showing the concentration remaining after treatment divided by the concentration going in. So if, every, if no transformation occurred, we'd be at one. If everything was removed, we'd be at zero. And so you can see for our indicator compounds, we have removal of over 75%. And it looks pretty similar for fipronil, which we um, know from other studies undergoes both photo and biotransformation processes in the environment and in wastewater treatment plants. But some of our other compounds of ecotoxicological concern, um, like carbamazepine and sulfamethoxazole, were not removed in the open water wetland. 
So this is where um, our pretreatment comes in. And so as a, as a reminder, our hypothesis here was that ozonation might uh, address some of the contaminants that are not so well removed in the open water wetlands. All right, so the effect of ozone. I know this is um, kind of a busy figure, so I'm gonna walk you through it, but that was actually what we saw. So um, starting with a 10 ol here on the left, as a reminder, this is a compound that is removed by biotransformation in the open water wetlands. If we start with the first, um, the first bar, the atenolol coming into the open water wetland without ozone pretreatment, so a dose of zero ozone, 80% of that atenolol was removed in the open water wetland and about 20% was remaining after treatment. That's what the solid fraction of the bar shows. When we applied an ozone dose of 20 milligrams per liter, up, upstream of the wetland, that ozone removed about 30% of the atenolol, and then the wetland removed most of the rest. When we applied an ozone dose of 40 milligrams per liter, um, we saw that it removed about 70% of the atenolol coming in. The open water wetland removed about 20%, and there was a small fraction remaining. So you can read each um, compound in a similar way. What we see is that atenolol and metaprolol look pretty similar, and so does fipronil. Propranolol we saw was well removed either by phototransformation in the wetland or by ozone. And there wasn't really a benefit to combining the two because either one is pretty effective. Um, but what we see for carbamazepine and sulfamethoxazole that were not removed in the open water wetland, these two compounds actually have relatively high reaction rate constants with molecular ozone, um, which results in them being well removed in the ozone pretreatment. Um, and so when we combine then ozone pretreatment with the wetland, we do see um, that uh, it provides a benefit to most of these compounds that we were studying. But I'm gonna raise uh, another question just to uh, let, make this a little less satisfying, is what happens to these trace contaminants that we're saying are removed? And um, the sort of historical belief was that when trace organic contaminants went away, they got oxidized all the way to CO2. But what we're learning is that most of the time that transformation is not complete. And increasingly we see that it's really important to look for what else might be forming in our treatment systems when these uh, so-called parent compounds go away. So one example of that is the phototransformation of sulfamethoxazole. Here I'm showing a pathway that we um, elucidated in RO concentrate that contained nitrite. Um, and when we shown sunlight on this compound in the presence of nitrate and nitrite, it formed these series of transformation products that are all quite structurally similar to the parent compound, um, but include either nitro or hydroxyl groups um, and most undergo some form of uh, oxidation reaction. We also saw that these products were relatively stable under the experimental conditions. So they didn't undergo further phototransformation. Uh, some of these compounds like this middle one, uh, transformation product 283, um, an oxidation product. Uh, this one's actually been tested for antibacterial efficacy. So sulfamethoxazole is an antibiotic um, and its transformation product also acts essentially as an antibiotic. So it retains that ability to, um, to interfere with bacterial processes, which obviously could have an effect on um, microbial communities downstream of wastewater treatment plants. Other compounds like this transformation product with a molecular weight of 299 um, haven't been observed before. And so they may, might be problematic because of these nitrated groups, um, but it, we don't actually know the full effects of these and how important they are for the environmental toxicity. Um, here I'm just showing the formation of these different compounds um, in a radiated RO concentrate as sulfamethoxazole goes away. So photo processes can result in structurally similar um, transformation products. And so can biotransformation. So here we're back to uh, atenolol and metaprolol. And both of these actually biotransform into the closely related carboxylic acid called carboxymetaprolol or atenolol acid. 
And here in this figure, I'm showing the removal of atenolol and metoprolol and uh, the co coincident uh, formation of the carboxylic acid. In this case, actually studies have been done on the transformation product and it is less ecotoxic. So even this small change in structure um, can significantly reduce the risk depending on the structure of the compound. Um, in some ongoing work, uh, I'm working with folks at Colorado School of Mines to understand how the uh, redox conditions in the biomat could be affecting the rates and products that form from different compounds. So here we see in, in some cases, we see the formation of methane in lower, um, in lower depths in the biomat. And we think that this could affect the rate of removal of certain compounds. So for instance, in both of these, um, in these experiments, with wetland biomat, uh, where we fed in trace organic contaminants, we see that um, in these oxic, these oxic experiments that have methane present, in some cases we see slower uh, biotransformation, and in others we see faster biotransformation in the presence of methane. And this is actually um, really interesting for sulfamethoxazole. Sulfamethoxazole um, has been shown to undergo faster biotransformation in the presence of ammonia monooxygenase or when ammonia is being oxidized um, by bacteria. And here we are hypothesizing that uh, the similar enzyme, methane monooxygenase, might be responsible for oxidizing sulfamethoxazole. So in any case, what we are querying here is the effect of um, the conditions that we might be able to design for in a wetland system um, and how that affects the mechanisms and the pathways of transformation of our organic contaminants. Um, I'm going to make it even more complicated for a second uh, because in the open water wetlands when we have photo and biotransformation co-occurring we can get kind of a web of transformation products. So this is work um, done by uh, my colleague Karsten Prosse, who's now at uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, who showed that, that uh, abacavir undergoes biotransformation at the alcohol group to form a carboxylic acid, but under sunlight, it undergoes transformation at the cyclopropylamine group to give uh, several different products. And when you have both happening simultaneously in the open water wetland, um, you can think of these two moieties on the molecule almost independently in terms of the site of attack of the next reaction. So um, in, in, in many cases, the, the rate might not, uh, the rate of photolysis might not change because biotransformation is happening, but the product um, that you detect might be um, a, a product of both bio and photo processes. And then just to highlight that most of these products are not yet tested for toxicity. So a lot of research going forward in trace contaminants is also about the, those products and, and their implications. All right, one more uh, example from the RO concentrate wetland is fipronil. Uh, I mentioned fipronil at the very beginning and that it has a, rel it's toxic to aquatic organisms at relatively low levels. Um, it also has several transformations products with known aquatic toxicity. So it forms a sulfide through reductive biotransformation. It forms a desulfonyl product through phototransformation, and it forms a sulfone through oxidative biotransformation. In the open water wetlands, we saw removal of the parent compound in the wetland. So a decrease in that dark blue bar from inlet to wetland treated and an increase in the desulfonyl product, so that light gray. And this is what we would expect because we saw it indicates uh, the occurrence of phototransformation since we saw the formation of a photo product. During ozone treatment, we also see removal of fipronil, the parent compound, and we see the formation of the sulfone product or the oxidation product. Um, and then when we combine both, um, we see removal overall of the total sum of fiproles. And this is um, sort of what we would like to have for more compounds is know, knowing that the sum of 
the parent and its toxic products is, are all going down. In most cases, we don't have as much data as we do for fipronil about the products and their toxicity, but this type of evidence gives us more uh, confidence in the efficacy of our treatment. So um, that's uh, most of, that's where I wanna leave it with the open water wetlands. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about other, um, other systems, other nature-based treatment systems, because these are sort of a unique case um, and now, uh, as a postdoc at UC Berkeley, I'm working with a uh, PhD student ne named Angela Stiegler on these uh, subsurface flow wetlands uh, call that we call horizontal levees. This is a picture, uh, this is from maybe two years ago. Uh, the plants are a lot taller now. Uh, this is in San Lorenzo, California. And, um, yeah, there it is uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this system has been operated for the past several years, uh, receiving wastewater from an adjacent wastewater treatment plant. And the water actually flows through the subsurface um, and, uh, and undergoes treatment by those processes of absorption and biotransformation and plant uptake that I talked about before. And the really cool thing about this system um, is it's a little bit more uh, like what you might think of as a constructed wetland in that it can also provide some of these other benefits besides improving water quality. Um, this system is actually designed to reduce flood risk um, because it is built as a slope. It's kind of hard to tell in this uh, picture, but the idea is that it could sit on the um, water side of a, of a uh, concrete levee and provide a sloped surface that breaks uh, waves and reduces the uh, possibility of, um, of storm levee failure. And it also can provide shoreline habitat um, for uh, local species. So it, it provides some of those other uh, nature-based solution uh, benefits that we might be interested in. And this system has, um, has been studied for the past several years um, with respect to its ability to treat municipal wastewater effluent. So it removes nitrate and several trace organic contaminants in the first about 10 meters of the slope. Um, and this is work um, done by Angela and uh, by my colleague uh, Aidan Cicchetti. And they um, found that essentially all of the water that's flowing through the subsurface gets treated in those first 10 meters. This red line at the top is water that um, flowed over the surface of, uh, of the ground. And so it actually didn't um, undergo the same treatment. And we saw that it was ineffective to have water flowing over the top. But currently we're working on understanding um, how this system works with RO concentrate. So we've converted part of the wetland to receive um, reverse osmosis concentrate. And we're working to understand the biotransformation pathways and, and its performance for that. Um, I also want to circle back to um, the, the uh, question of stormwater runoff, um, because I kind of teased this at the beginning, but there's a lot of questions about how nature-based systems, including things like bioretention cells, can remove contaminants that occur in urban stor stormwater. Um, and this includes all sorts of things that run off from our cities. Um, and many of them have known um, toxicity issues, including um, things like fungicides, like these imidazoles and triazoles and strobulins. Um, flame retardants that are organic phosphates, phthalates, um, insecticides. So um, we have a lot of opportunities still to better engineer our um, urban uh, nature-based treatment systems for better performance for many of these contaminants um, because most current uh, bioretention systems are not tested for these compounds or really designed for them. So I'm gonna leave it there for the nature-based treatment systems and give a few takeaways from this um, uh, area of research. One would be that uh, the trace contaminants that are present in wastewater, stormwater, and reverse osmosis concentrate can pose risks to aquatic ecosystems. 
um, the nature-based treatment systems can reduce contaminant concentrations. Um, and they also do other really important things like providing habitat and climate change adaptation benefits that can make them a lot uh, more attractive to decision makers. Uh, the open water wetlands and horizontal levees that we study can remove nitrate and some uh, organic contaminants from wastewater and RO concentrate. I didn't actually get into the um, nitrate results from the open water wetland, but we did see denitrification occurring there. Um, and we always wanna consider transformation products and their pathways. Um, when we're evaluating treatment technologies in order to better address uh, risk and optimize the technologies. I also want to note that in some cases there are contaminants that are really um, not feasible to remove in these treatment uh, technologies and that's where I think there's room for safer chemical alternatives that could replace uh, some of these uh, more toxic chemicals that are really persistent in our water pro treatment processes. So I'll give a couple of examples. Um, one class of contaminants that is particularly uh, persistent and widely used are what we call PFAS. These are per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Um, you might have seen them in the news lately. I don't know how much of a water bubble I'm in on that one, uh, but these are being called forever chemicals. They're present in many products uh, ranging from firefighting foams to coatings on food packaging. They're on your waterproof outdoors gear. They're on your nonstick frying pans. Um, and these compounds uh, have been used a lot because they're really great surfactants. They're, um, they're oleophobic and hydrophobic and uh, impart these really unique properties that we found all sorts of uses for. Unfortunately, we're learning more and more about their toxicity and um, the range of health problems that they can cause. And they're very persistent in the environment and in our treatment systems um, because uh, they're, they're um, strong carbon fluorine bonds are really, uh, almost impossible to break. And so, and so the PFAS class of compounds um, is, is being sort of targeted for phase out from as many applications as possible. And uh, folks are trying to seek out uh, safer alternatives. Another um, class of compounds, which is actually definitely more than one class are are biocides. And these are often used in applications where they might not even go through a water treatment process um, and might go directly into the environment. So if you think about the use of insecticides um, and um, herbicides, fungicides that are used outdoors um, and might not get captured and taken to a wastewater treatment plant, um, but are often persistent and can cause uh, harm to non-target organisms. So the group that I'm, I'm working with a group at the US Department of Agriculture that's trying to design uh, safer biocides. This is some of um, the early work out of the group um, trying to screen different, um, different potential uh, uh, molecules that could be used as preservatives and uh, understand both their uh, efficacy against um, pathogenic organisms and their safety with respect to human and environmental health. So we're specifically looking at phenolic acids, esters, and amides um, with this idea that small structural modifications could have um, differential impacts on efficacy and human health hazards. Um, and the, these are a little bit busy, so I'll, I'll walk you through these two. But essentially each of these spider plots um, is showing trade-offs between different preservative compounds um, with respect to their efficacy and their safety. So for fungal effect and bacterial effect, this is indicating how effective that compound was at suppressing the growth of Aspergillus, uh, Brasiliensis, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So that's a mold and a gram-negative bacteria. Um, and the the closer to the center the um, line is, the better for all of the endpoints. So this 
in this case, octyl gallate was more effective than um, phenoxyethanol and the parabens at uh, pro prohibiting the growth of fungi. These other four points are related to human and environmental health. So group one, group two, and group three, to star <laughs> are uh, human health endpoints. And basically a hazard assessment was conducted um, to assess the weight of evidence uh, with regards to um, its, each compound's contribution to these health endpoints. Group one includes things like carcinogenicity and reproductive and development toxicity. Group two is things like uh, neurotoxicity, um, and skin irritation, eye irritation, and chronic group two is sensitization. Environmental tox includes um, persistence, bioaccumulation, and aquatic toxicity. And so what we can see here in this left most spider diagram um, is uh, octal gallate was identified as a potentially effective, safer alternative to these preservatives that are currently used in home and personal care products, um, which are phenoxyethanol and methyl and propyl paraben. Um, the second and third uh, spider diagrams show the same comparison uh, for food packaging and building material applications. So oxalgallate is compared um, for three different applications. And we can see the hazard um, profile for octogallate is somewhat similar to those for the parabens um, and is potentially safer than some of the other current use alternatives, particularly um, for building materials over here on the right side. But this is just um, sort of setting the stage for the approach of trying to um, analyze trade-offs between efficacy and safety and identify uh, compounds with a structure that allows you to achieve both as much as possible. We've been um, expanding this analysis to look at other classes of compounds. So here um, I'm showing compounds, uh, the, the antifungal and antibacterial efficacy of a broad array of compounds um, from these eight different classes. And each axis is the minimum inhibitory concentration for that organism, for that for um, the set of compounds in that class. So um, for phenols, you can see we had um, one compound that was effective against aspergillus at 0.1 weight percent and 0.001 weight percent for pseudomonas. Um, in general, we want compounds to be in this lower left corner, so effective against both organisms. Um, but you can see we have a broad range of effectiveness for in, in all these compounds that were screened. Um, and this was sort of casting a wide net um, of, of, uh, of trying lots of different uh, compounds and trying to assess if there's a relationship between um, effectiveness and safety. So after um, doing this initial screen, we chose the most effective compounds and assessed their hazard profiles. Um, and so we selected compounds that were effective at less than one weight percent and prioritized compounds that um, had hazard data available and then compared them against some current use preservatives. So down at the bottom here, um, you can see the profiles for two currently used preservatives, which is methyl isothiazolinone and a formaldehyde releaser called DMDM hydantone. And these are um, skin sensitizers. They have some irritation properties and acute toxicity um, and environmental aquatic toxicity. Um, so these are what we're trying to find a safer replacement for. Um, and, and the colors are, are coded for hazard. So L is for low hazard. VH is for very high hazard, H is for high hazard, M is for medium uh, or moderate. Um, and what we can see here is that our phenols that we looked at had pretty similar profiles to those existing uh, current use preservatives. Um, there are four compounds I'm gonna draw your attention to that uh, were uh, 
interest to us. Um, one is, uh, or I guess, capital glycol and uh, phenoxyethanol uh, had some mixed evidence regarding their uh, reproductive and developmental toxicity, but otherwise had relatively low hazard side from um, eye irritation. Um, capital hydroxamic acid down here uh, was a relatively effective uh, organic acid um, and has relatively low hazard profile. Zorbitan caprolate was our lowest hazard profile, but was um, less effective in our screen. So um, we weren't sure how effective it would be. And we included, um, we also selected propyl gallate to continue um, assessing just as a, um, as a phenol um, that we could compare to the others. And what we did with these four compounds then, and we've narrowed down our list, um, we tested these in um, a home cleaning formulation or a general sort of surfactant formula. Um, and we plated these for two weeks in a personal care product preservative test um, with the active ingredients present at one weight percent. And we're just testing whether they could be effective in a formulation. So testing the the earlier tests were just testing the active um, ingredient. And here they're being tested um, as they would be used in a formulation um, in order to assess a, sort of a better, a more realistic assessment of their effectiveness. And all except Zorbitan caprolate were effective against Pseudomonas, so on the right. And uh, capryl hydroxamic acid and capryl glycol were effective for both. So um, this gives just sort of um, an overview of how we are starting to approach coming up with safer alternatives. Um, the ultimate goal is to uh, develop more knowledge about chemical classes and their, uh, the relationship between their structure, the structure of these molecules and their activity with respect to both um, antibacterial efficacy and safety in order to design safer biocides. And we're actually we're working on designing totally new biocides um, with lower hazard and high efficacy, building on this idea um, and um, trying to make compounds that uh, are uh, totally non-persistent, that rapidly dissociate in water. So um, more on that in, the, in a future presentation. Stay, stay tuned on that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, with that, I will, um, I will uh, just acknowledge the many uh, collaborators and uh, sources of support for this work, um, which has come from many different agencies. Um, we worked with a lot of uh, folks to get that uh, pilot study of the open water wetland going. And of course, uh, my team at the USDA also, uh, who I've been working with. And with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was uh, a really an impressive talk. <laughs> that was that was a very wide ranging but but wonderfully cohesive talk, which was fantastic. Um, all right, so we will just jump straight into the questions. There's a good number of them. Um, and I will, you know, if, if anybody has additional questions as we go along, please feel free to ask them uh, as we go. Uh, so our first question here is, um, do current water treatment solutions uh, produce their own waste streams, so things like non-reusable filters? Mm, yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are certainly uh, waste products associated with many of our treatment processes. Um, so for instance, the, the filtration systems I talked about usually undergo um, pretty frequent cycles of cleaning, uh, mm -hmm. and eventually they, eventually they need to be replaced. It's usually they last several years before needing to be replaced, but they're taken offline to be cleaned um, uh, on like a monthly or several month basis. But that some of the things that do produce more sort of disposables are um, like activated carbon fil filters um, mm -hmm. where you, you have um, like media filtration. So your water is flowing through um, a really uh, highly absorbent material Okay. And then when that gets saturated, 
um, with, with contaminants and no longer has uh, available absorption sites, mm -hmm. it has to, it's usually disposed of. Okay. So yeah, depends right. on the treatment process, but certainly there are waste streams associated with, with those. Makes sense. Um, could you use, so you talked, you talked some about using, um, sunlight as, as, you know, to, to induce photo, uh, photo transformations. Um, has, has there been any work in looking at like concentrated sunlight? Um, you know, like, like putting a, you know, a curved lens over the, the water beds that you described and to, mm. to try and basically, you know, enhance the, the rate of photophysical transformations or maybe even, um, induce some that don't really happen under normal conditions? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I'm, I don't know of anyone who's, who's tried that, um, but it's, it's an interesting thought exercise. Um, a lot of treatment systems do use UV light, which tends to be um, more uh, efficient than sunlight because mm -hmm. uh, most organic contaminants don't absorb as strongly in the sunlight spectrum as they do with at uh, the wavelengths of UV lamps. Okay. Um, so those like UV uh, treatment systems um, can be more effective or at least the rates are faster um, okay. than these sunlight systems. Mm -hmm. um, but concentrating the, concentrating the UV or the sunlight um, could also potentially increase your rates. Um, yeah. I, okay. It's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, so in the, the open water beds that you showed, um, because they're open is, is evaporation of the water an issue in the open unit in the open process or is it, is it moving through quickly enough that that's not really a big issue? We do get some evaporation in, in a three day retention time, um, system, about 10% of the water evaporates. Okay, so that's not, not a ton. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, has anyone looked at recombinant bacteria with cytochrome P450s? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that's, that's completely <laughs> outside my area, so I'm, I'm reading that one uh, <laughs> off the question board. Um, I don't think anyone has looked at that in these systems. Okay. Um, I'm not super familiar with that either, but, uh, the, our, the folks from Colorado school of mines are my microbiology friends mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm by no means a microbiologist, but, um, the work that they've done has, uh, been sort of to characterize who's there. So doing sequencing, um, and, uh, querying the presence of functional genes mm -hmm. um, for denitrification. Um, maybe whoever is asking this question who knows a lot of microbiology can uh, yeah. <laughs> follow up if there's something that they yeah, want to know, yeah. uh, uh, more specifically. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, Rama, if you want to, maybe, maybe you can uh, clarify the question just a little bit because, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a microbiologist either. So. <laughs> And that, that, that showed very clearly in my asking of that one. Uh, so yeah, so Rama, yeah, if you want to, if you want to follow up with that, maybe, maybe add a little more detail uh, with what you're thinking, that'd be great. Um, can you use, uh, so, you so you talked about uh, the, like the ozone treatment, sunlight treatment, things like that. Um, has anybody looked at using waste heat to, for any of these water treatments? Like if you have, you know, from a, uh, from a factory or something like that? Hmm. Using waste heat to like warm up. Yeah, like, or like like to tr to induce uh, you know degradation of of contaminants or something like that, or or assist in uh, the hmm. transformations that you're trying to achieve, or the or the breakdowns that you want to achieve. Yeah, um, I don't know. I haven't I haven't really heard of of doing things like that. Mm -hmm. I guess like. Um, what that brings to mind for me is, um, you know, these reactions are certainly slower under colder conditions. And we see mm -hmm. that effect of seasonality really strongly. Um, okay. And actually the wastewater that comes in is significantly colder in the winter just because it's going through pipes sure. that are colder. 
Um, so yeah, I guess there's a possibility that doing something to um, warm it up, if, especially if there was a waste heat, um, could potentially help. Um, I I haven't come across that idea as um, something anyone has tried that I know of. Okay. Um, so our next question here is: uh, Could the do do you worry about the potential for the bio transformation? um to produce other toxic chemicals um you, you kind of touched on this with the you know with with breaking down the different pathways um mm -hmm. but is that something that, that is that is that a big concern um as, as part of the work yeah um we do it certainly can be um mm -hmm. i most of the um most of the really problematic transformation products that we've come across lately, I would say come from these um, chemical reactions more so than biological mm -hmm. transformations. Um, maybe because biology prefers not to make really toxic things okay. as much as um, abiotic reactions. So like, for instance, oxidation and chlorination processes produce these really um, more electrophilic products um, that can uh, that tend to be more more toxic um, bio biotransformation products can definitely also be similarly toxic to the parent compound mm -hmm. I'm kind of struggling to come up with an example where it's a lot more toxic than the parent compound that, that, that's okay. Um, but it, it yeah. might, it might, it might exist. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Rama, Rama, the the one who asked uh, the the uh, chatter who asked about the the uh, P five fifty. Um, actually, I'll go about this. The, yeah, the, the recombinant bacteria with cytochrome P P four fifties. She says the the P four fifty are an awesome group of oxidases and are the enzymes that destroy any xenobiotic that enters our body. Um, so the basic idea is if you can engineer bacteria with those enzymes, they might be effective um, mm. for this or for, for these I treatment. See. Yeah. So. I see. So trying to, trying to um, engineer bacteria that are more able to do these transformations. That's, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's an interesting idea. Um, and um yeah there's definitely a lot of work being done to try to tie the activity of specific enzymes to these contaminant transformations mm -hmm. like i meant i mentioned the um ammonia monooxygenases and the methane monooxygenases mm -hmm. um and so it's often really hard though to uh isolate which um which enzyme is responsible because most of the processes in these systems are co-metabolic so the sure. contaminant itself is not the main substrate that that organism is growing on it's kind of incidental that it gets oxidized mm -hmm. um but i don't know enough about like p450 enzymes to know whether um know sort of which contaminants they'd be able to address okay cool um so uh, Rama also wanted to ask if you could seed the biomat with specific strains um, as, and especially ones with organic utilization pathways. Mm. Yeah, this is something I've been thinking about too is um, whether we could get a more, what how we could encourage a, the most effective biomat to grow. So mm -hmm. I guess um, there's a trade off, right, between seeding it with something. Uh, and trying to keep that community dominant over other things that might uh, uh, come in and compete with it. Mm -hmm. Another approach that we've thought about is putting um, a particular substrate in there. So like if we added some, like for instance, wood chips, would mm -hmm. we get a community that's really good at growing on wood chips and therefore breaking down complex organic matter Okay. and therefore have more effective organic contaminant transformation because there are very specific enzymes needed to break down lignocellulose 
Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, a direction that I think has a lot of interesting questions in it. Okay. And I guess I'll kind of piggyback off of that because this question is a little bit similar. Um, could you could you purposefully design these constructed wetlands such that, like, let's say you know that that a the 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 waste stream has a you know a higher amount of a certain element or a certain compound? Um, could you could you pick certain biomat to or, or certain plants to basically take up those those particular compounds? Um, and then basically be, for instance, harvested. So, like, you, you know, you, you, you pull that out and then basically take away um, mm-hmm. some of the wetlands. Is that, is that a feasible thing or is that kind of, does that sort of defeat the point, I guess? Yeah, no, it does. It, um, it's a really good question. And it's something I think that's been looked at more for, like, trace metals. Mm-hmm. So certain plants will... Um, they're called hyperaccumulators, and they'll take up um, especially high concentrations of metals. And oh. um, I didn't really get into the trace metals today, mm-hmm. but those can also be really important contaminants to remove um, from water before it h- hits um, receiving waters. And um, yeah, these these hyperaccumulators can uh, pull a lot of trace metals uh, into the biomass, and then if you harvest it once a year. Um, you've got, I mean, you've got a lot of metals in, in, in the biomass, yeah. you still have to do something with it, okay. but you can pull it out of the water and manage it offsite, um, somewhere that might be more equipped to deal with those. Okay. Um, yeah. That's, that's really cool. I, I didn't, I, w- I was not aware that they had super accumulators, so that's, that's good. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, so let's see. Um, so it, so you, you, some of the, some of these systems that you're describing use um, direct sunlight. So are they practical in the winter when you have, or, or in in you know w- whatever part of the year where the sunlight is less direct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's definitely a high effect of seasonality, particularly in those um, surface flow systems, mm-hmm. um, both because of reduced sunlight and because of lower temperatures as as we were talking about earlier okay Uh, um and so uh the treatment does drop off a lot in the winter in those surface flow much less in the subsurface ones the subsurface ones tend to keep working even in the winter um but yeah so there are a couple of reasons that that might be okay though so Mm -hmm. one is that um in this particular instance of ro concentrate i actually a lot of reuse facilities are operating at higher capacity in the summer and might not really be operating in the winter Mm -hmm. because there's enough water to use without doing reuse in the winter. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. And so you might have plentiful um, other resources that are are cheaper to use than operating your advanced water reuse facility. So, Mm -hmm. um, so in that particular case, you might not need as much, treatment in the winter um that makes sense and you might also have more dilution in the winter entering your entering your receiving water so um the okay. the concentrations experienced by um your aquatic ecosystem might be lower even if you're putting the same wastewater in okay so yeah it's not it's not ideal to keep putting sure. the contaminants in the environment <laughs> in the winter but they might have a less significant impact okay. than discharging them in the wind in the summer all right that i mean that that makes a lot of sense and, and you're right depending you know it's, it's not really going to be a fixed thing so it may be you, you you choose some practicality over the the perfect solution which makes we don't have a perfect solution so. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, that's, that's really cool. Um, okay. Uh, could you talk about how you, you so you talked about the, the transformation products that you, that you find, you know, for, for uh, I forget which molecule you gave the specific example of, um, but could you talk about how you detect those different transformation problem uh, products and also differentiate between them? Cause you had some that had, it looked like they had the same molecular weight, but were slightly different. Um, could you talk about how you, how you both detect and differentiate between those? Sure. Yeah. So um, for the compounds that I talked about today, we mostly do um, analyze these using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. Mm-hmm. Um, and the 
uh, initial like detection of a product or an, and an approximate molecular weight, you can get um, in sort of a what is becoming a standard, which is an LC triple quadrupole mass spec. So you can okay. just um, you can run sort of scans on your mass spec to look for uh, 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 peaks that occur in uh, in samples that you would expect that the parent compound has gone away in. So we mostly, mm -hmm. when we're detecting transformation products, we start by doing it in spiked experiments where we have higher concentrations of the parent compound in order okay. to be able to see something else forming, like a new peak coming up on our chromatogram. Uh, okay. Um, in order to definitively identify what that is, um, we try to get a standard of that compound if it's if it exists, mm -hmm. um, so that you can match the mass and the retention time on your um, LCMS. Mm -hmm. If you, if there isn't a standard, another tool that we use is high resolution mass spectrometry. So for those um, compounds that I said hadn't been detected before, mm -hmm. we used. Um, an orbit trap. So that's a high res mass spec that gives us a lot of um, precision in the mass of the, um, of the molecule or the ion. And that allows us to more definitively uh, produce a uh, chemical formula. Mm -hmm. And from there, we hypothesize the structure of the molecule based on what we know is happening in the system. Um, and in order to separate like isomers, um, mm -hmm. we have to move to even more, uh, other techniques. Okay. So, um, the reason I showed two different structures for that molecule is actually, we tried to separate them, um, ch chromatographically and could not, and we tried to separate them, <laughs> um, with ion mobility mass spec and also um weren't seeing any differentiation okay. so um so we're not sure which of those two we have ah okay <laughs> um, all right yeah but we do we do, um use sort of a combination of different types of mass spectrometry to try to isolate um based on um based on structure based on different um aspects of that structure okay that's that's really impressive because some of those I mean the, given the similarity that's that's got to be a tough thing to do. <laughs> it's definitely, that's, um, you know, part of why characterizing all the products is such a challenge is it's pretty um, intensive, labor intensive to try to identify new products. Oh, I'm sure. Well, and I guess, I mean, you probably in, in the, the actual samples, you probably aren't, you, you may or may not be dealing with, with high amounts either. So I'm sure, right. you know, trying to, trying to detect a small product that is very similar to a whole lot of other small products can't be easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're getting better at it, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's still a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Uh, let's see. So could you, is, is distillation uh, an object or, or an option as, as a treatment um, for in the, in these systems? Yeah, distillation is used more in desalination, and that's because it's a really energy intensive compared to um, even these um, things like reverse osmosis. Okay. Um, and so we use it when we're beyond the like like reverse osmosis membranes work up to a certain salinity, and then they just the osmotic pressure isn't enough of a there's not enough of a pressure differential to overcome the osmotic pressure. Mm -hmm. So um, in any case, you can use RO up to a point, but once you're at higher salinity than that, um, okay. we go to uh, other forms that, <laughs> of uh, separating water from salt that include things like distillation, of okay. evaporators and crystallizers and things like that. All right. Um... Can you utilize uh, chemoenzymatic diversification to modify these molecules as part of green chemistry? That was another. That's another one from Rama. I'm I'm intrigued. Um, Rama, you want to follow up and clarify on that one too? <laughs> uh, 
Dr. Kothapali is, is very smart. She asks a lot of really good questions. So uh, I'm sure she will be happy to uh, give a little more detail. So we'll, we'll, let's come back to that one. Uh, Great. Let's see. So when it comes to the stormwater case, you said you need to chemically treat some of the compounds in it uh, because the biological green system can't break those down. Um, where in the stormwater flow would that treatment happen? Uh, it seems hard to capture for an application like that. Mm, yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, and I may not have a satisfying answer for that, but, um, yeah, one, because for stormwater, you're dealing with two, two different issues, really. You're dealing with trying to divert all this flow so that you're not getting flooding. You're trying to just like mm -hmm. capture and get it out of the city. And you're also trying to hopefully remove some of the contaminants. And so you're, the challenge is like these bioretention systems, if you, if you had bioswales all over your city and you could get the water to mostly flow into them, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, that in itself is hard to sort of do as a planning exercise and figure out where they would optimally be located. Um, right. But the, then you need the water to pass through them quite quickly. Uh, sure. So they don't get waterlogged and mm -hmm. Um, just biotransformation, we ha don't know how to make it fast enough <laughs> to, um, to operate under those conditions and be effective. So mm -hmm. there might be a way where you put a UV lamp um, in, a, uh, in a dry well. That's something that um, like the city of Los Angeles has been looking at um, using dry wells as stormwater treatment um, space mm -hmm. more or less okay um, that's some research going on in, in um in uh my the group where i did my phd and um looking at how whether we could do sort of chemical treatment or uv light treatment of um stormwater but it's it's really really a challenge to um try to both be moving the water as quickly as possible and treating it yeah <laughs> so, yeah absolutely yeah. So I, I guess along the same lines, uh, this and the answer may be this is entirely impractical, um, but could could uh, like drainage systems like like you know on my street we have drains so like when when it rains heavily you know the water flows downhill into these drains and they you know it gets basically siphoned off uh, into you know sewer system or something like that. Um, is would it would it be I mean, I guess it'd be possible. Is is it reasonable to do something like what you're describing with the dry wells, but maybe like put UV lights down in sewer pipes and things like that, like, you know, maybe as they're being replaced um, and, and doing a treatment, you know, so e even if the treatment's not uh, substantial, you know, at a given point, but, you know, because it's it's throughout this longer system that the water's going to travel through anyway, is is that something that, that might make a difference or is that just, is, is that... In, ineffective enough that it's unlikely to happen um i i wouldn't totally rule it out i don't i don't know um i think one challenge would be that uv light needs is usually implemented where the light can be in very close contact with the water so you might need a lot of lights in your sewer if you have a large sewer system okay but um but yeah, I mean, potentially finding a way to treat along the conveyance system um, mm -hmm. could be an approach. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's worth it's worth thinking about anyway. Um, sure. I have, have little experience with actual sewer pipes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm same. Not, I'm same. Not <laughs> <laughs> but, I hopefully, um, I hope to keep it that way, but. <laughs> But no, I think, you know, it's a really interesting idea and um, something that I've wondered too is could you put something, you know, could you put something at the end of the pipe uh, mm -hmm. or could you put something, yeah, maybe even inside of it. Okay. Um, okay, so Rama, Rama did clarify a little bit. So the, the, what she was talking about is basically you have enzymes that are, are uh, very promiscuous and will use many similar looking substrates to convert them. Um, and so basically, if you can identify these enzymes, they can be used to break down your products of interest. Um, hmm. So, interesting. <laughs> least, cool. Again, way, way outside of anything I know anything about. So, uh, it sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
that's great. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I guess I'll give uh, any any last minute questions anybody wants to get in. Um, please feel free to do so. Um, but if if that's it, that was a lot of really good questions and with a lot of great answers as well. Um, and so I guess I'll go ahead and start wrapping up. And if, if we get any last second questions, I'll, we'll go through them real quick. Um, but I'd like to thank Dr. Rachel Scholes uh, from, from Berkeley. Uh, like I said, this was, this was a really interesting talk. You covered a lot of different, uh, a lot of different disciplines. And uh, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, I got I got exposure to far more than I thought I was going to, uh, and it but the, but it was really nice and cohesive. So it was it was a well done talk. In addition to being uh, very very uh, informationally dense, which is like that's that's the best combination. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, oh, Rama Rama says that your research is a gold mine for NIEHS funding, uh, and, and recommends looking into them. Thank you so much. Um, and and uh, yeah, lots of people in the chat are also saying it was a fantastic talk as well. So, uh, you know, I agree. <laughs> that was really cool. Um, I think that's all the questions we've got. Um, and so uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Um, so thank you again, Rachel. Like I said, uh, just really wonderful talk. Um, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And um, uh, thank you to everybody for coming out and watching uh, and asking really, really uh fantastic questions that's that's one of my favorite parts is seeing all the different uh thoughts that come in from the different backgrounds um, and uh rachel if i could get you to stick around for just a second we'll, we'll chat real quick um, before i let you go um sure. and uh yeah so thank you again to everybody uh we'll be back again next week um let me check and see who we've got if, I, don't, I can never remember Keep a, a keep a list here. Uh, we have oh, Dr. Conrad Goodwin. He's going to be talking about um, uh, uh, chemistry of, of heavy elements like uranium and, and plutonium. So that should be fantastic. Um, so uh, I hope you will all come back next week um, and and check that one out. Uh, it should be an interesting talk too. And uh, for for the time being, have a great weekend. Uh, have a lovely evening. Please keep wearing masks and get vaccinated. And uh, we'll see you all next week, I hope. Thanks a lot.